Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Porras, and coming up in today's newscast, Israel's reporting the lowest daily coronavirus infection rate in weeks as Israel's Teva Pharmaceuticals prepares to help in producing COVID vaccines. Meanwhile, apparent confirmation of Israel's involvement in the assassination of Iranian scientist Mohsen Fakhrizadeh. And finally, fake food that you both can and probably should be eating. Stay tuned for the future of sustainable, ethical eats. Much to parents' relief following over a month of coronavirus lockdowns, preschools and general classes for grades 1 through 4 and 11 and 12 are resuming in low to medium infection zones. But just hours before classes reopened to several hundred thousand Israeli kids, many questions were still left unanswered. Questions often as simple as, is my school included in the reopening? Confusion being blamed on the health ministry's overly complex plan for easing out of closures, and great concerns also rising about teachers who live in red areas traveling to teach in so-called green or yellow areas. But in response to these concerns, Health Minister Yuli Edelstein is planning to, to draft a bill obliging teaching staff to go and get vaccinated. And this as national infection rates finally drop to the lowest that they've been in weeks. The lockdown and vaccine campaign reducing active infections to roughly 68,000. Not everyone is lifting restrictions gradually, though raising repeated fears of a return to infection. Israeli police warning that dozens of businesses and several shopping malls are expected to open on Thursday in rebellion against national closures. Additionally, many Haredi education institutions are vowing to continue operating illegally with or without government approval. New reports showing an already dire situation in the ultra-Orthodox community, with at least one in every 73 Haredi Israelis over age 65 dying of COVID-19. Now, thankfully, millions of Israelis have been vaccinated, but billions more vaccinations are needed both for Israel and for the rest of the world. Israeli Pharma, therefore, getting involved in the production efforts. Israeli pharmaceutical company Teva, the world's largest generic drug manufacturer, is now looking to help in producing life-saving coronavirus vaccines. Teva CEO Kari Schultz explaining that major vaccine developers had approached Teva at the same time that Teva was reaching out to them. And while no companies have been named and no agreements revealed, Schultz is saying that the company feels positive about making a contribution. Teva having already partnered in Israel's world-leading COVID vaccine distribution. We're very proud to be the partners taking care of all the logistics with the vaccines in Israel. So we pick them up in the airport, take them to our big logistics center, and then uh, we sort of uh, change the packs so that the pack sizes matches the needs in any of the 400 400 vaccination centers around Israel, and then we, we make sure that the right quantity gets to the right center at the right time. So this has been an extremely exciting time in Israel. It's estimated that 11 of Teva's 61 global manufacturing sites will be divested towards vaccine production. But Israel also still battling a seemingly growing trend of refusing to get the vaccine jab. Health authorities then releasing new details on restrictions for unvaccinated individuals, particularly by barring or limiting unvaccinated Israelis from access to leisure activities as they open from nationwide lockdowns. Things like going to gyms, cafes, restaurants, cultural and sporting events, and more. Health Minister Yuli Edelstein outlining a green pass system where vaccinated citizens can prove themselves through an official government-issued app. And over 2 million Israelis are already eligible for these green passes while non-vaccinated Israelis will in the meantime be able to use the app to display results of a negative COVID test for up to 72 hours after the test is taken. Now, in addition to vaccinations and new treatments for COVID-19, there's still a lot to be done in combating the ongoing pandemic. Many pregnant women, for one, still requiring additional attention considering their condition. But Israel's Sheba Medical Center, in collaboration with the high-tech industry in Israel, is developing solutions and joining me with the details is Director of the Women's Health Innovation Center at Shiva Tel HaShomer Hospital, Avi Tzul. Avi, thank you so much for being with us. Now, what do pregnant women with COVID-19 need that is different from other patients? So, the, uh, naturally, the most important thing is our ability to follow up the babies, so the fetuses. So, until now, 
when we were talking about telemedicine, about remote care, we always thought about following the patient, following the blood pressure, following the vital signs, following the physical examination. But here with pregnant women, we want to follow the well-being of the fetus. And that's our innovation at Shiba that we are connecting with cutting edge companies to allow following the fetus with ultrasound and fetal monitoring. We're going to be starting to do it now in a women in the pregnancy COVID-19 unit. And later on, after we feel comfortable, we start following women at home using the same technologies. So first of all, what, what is the technology called? I think we need to know that. That's right. So um, we start when we follow pregnant women with COVID-19, the first thing we need is to follow the same things like any patient. That means vital signs and oscillating lungs. And we do that using a title that is used in many other uh, departments in the, in the Shiva Medical Center. But then when we start thinking about uh, ultrasound, so specifically, we use a, an Israeli technology of pulse and more that allows the women by themselves, they take this, they scan themselves very easily. We guide them from, from beyond and they can scan their fetus and we can see it from beyond and see all the things we need to know for the biophysical profile of the fetus. We know the heart rate, we know wow. uh, the fetus is breathing, we know the uh, amniotic fluid, we see movements, we, we see the tonus. Um, and then to know fetal viability, we use another technology, specifically of Heramed, that allows us monitoring of the fetal heart rate. Wow. All right. So uh, what are maybe some specific goals that you have for, for using this technology? So our short-term goal currently in the COVID-19 pregnancy unit is to, on the one hand, improve availability of treatment. So, you know, currently each time a patient calls us, we need to dress, come in, we need to clean the equipment between patients. And now we can, uh, each of our patients in the COVID-19 unit has its own equipment, its own ultrasound, its own fetal heart rate monitor, its own title. And then whenever they have a complaint, we can directly examine them without needing to come in and out. And the second thing is uh, safety of the team and preventing cross infection between patients. Especially now when we have different COVID-19 mutations, we need to be even careful more than before, uh, even with all the women that are already infected with COVID-19. Our long-term goal is to provide treatment at home, is to, we have women, uh, on the one hand, we want to uh, currently in the COVID-19 era, we want to prevent women coming to hospital whenever we can follow them at home. It would be, it would be a great thing. But also after the COVID-19 era, we hope you know, women in the post-day pregnancy or women in high-risk clinics, they have to come every two days wow. or even once a week for many hours to the hospital. Many of our patients are CEOs or leaders of different companies. And we'll be more than happy to yeah. save the time, allow them to do it from home and from work without exactly. waiting for hours between. Yeah, I imagine that, that you're eliminating a big pressure on people's time. Uh, Avitsul, thank you so much for, for share, sharing this with us and, and congratulations on the advancement of this amazing technology. Thank you. All right, moving on. IDF training intensifying amidst growing belief that Hezbollah will likely attempt attacks in the coming year. The Israeli Defense Forces Northern Command holding large-scale exercises along the northern border on Tuesday and Wednesday. The two-day drill, dubbed Thunderstorm, testing the Northern Command's ability to rapidly respond to outbreaks of violence on the border. And this exercise is coming a week after Hezbollah fired anti-aircraft missiles at an Israeli drone and amidst warnings from military intelligence that Hezbollah may attempt to launch more serious attacks on the northern border sometime in the coming year. Now, the drill also then resting the, or testing the IDF's new attack coordination system known as Ring of Fire, with ground troops from the Northern Command taking part in the exercise alongside the Israeli Air Force, Navy, Teleprocessing Corps, Cyber Defense Unit, and Israeli Police. <laughs> We will get to the 
להפעיל את כל השיקולים שחלקם נפרסו פה על המסע, אבל אתם מוכנים למלחמה. Israeli security forces Wednesday in a rare daytime operation demolishing the home of the Palestinian terror suspect in Judea and Samaria. Just a week after getting permission from the Israeli High Court of Justice, Israeli defense forces are raising the two stories of a building near Jenin where suspected terrorist Mohammed Kaba lived with his family. And crowds popping up and clashing with the security forces in the community as Israeli forces entered the area in preparations for the rare daytime demolition. Typically, the military performs such operations under cover of darkness to cut down on potential obstacles or interference. Though demolitions are themselves fairly common practice as both a punishment for and deterrent against acts of terror. That said, while judges upheld the request to demolish Kaba's home, there is dissent over the justifications, with Court Justice Anat Baron suggesting in a minority opinion that just one of the floors be demolished, writing that she has not found any evidence that these demolitions achieve a real deterrent, if not even the opposite, and adding that demolishing the second floor in which Kaba's wife and children live would be disproportionate, as they were in no way involved in the attack. Kaba has confessed to the terrorist murder of Esther Holgan in late December 2020, an attack in which he repeatedly beat Holgan with stones to her head as the 52-year-old mother of six was out for a hike in the forest near her home. Kaba claims that this was somehow an act of vengeance for a security prisoner who died six weeks before of cancer. Citing anonymous sources within the Mossad, the Jewish Chronicle News on Wednesday alleging new information linking Israel, Israel to the killing of Iranian scientist Mohsen Fakhrizadeh. Khan Rifkin with the details. An assassination that shocked the world. The killing of top Iranian nuclear scientist and military official Mohsen Fakhrizadeh outside of Tehran in November 2020. It was also an act that set Iran's nuclear ambitions back by months, if not years, and which was largely blamed on Israel. But now, new testimony seems to confirm international suspicions, with British-based weekly, The Jewish Chronicle, citing anonymous intelligence sources, including Israel's Mossad. According to the Chronicle's report, the minutes-long ambush culminated eight months of close surveillance by a team of nearly two dozen agents, including both Israeli and Iranian nationals, and a one-ton gun. And the massively heavy weapon was apparently smuggled into the country piece by piece before being mounted to a truck and fired remotely. As for why the gun was so heavy, the report claims that most of the weight was in explosives designed to go off after the attack and destroy evidence. Then sources going on to claim that the attack was carried out without any involvement from the U.S. In fact, the White House was only even briefed after the operation was already underway. But whether actually carried out by Israelis or not, one thing is for certain. Israel had had its eyes on Fakhrizadeh for years, and his death did create a vacuum not easily filled. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu pointing to Fakhrizadeh's importance back in 2018 while exposing intel on Iran's nuclear program. And you will not be surprised to hear that Sapand is led by the same person who led Project Ahmad, Dr. Fakhrizadeh, and also, not coincidentally, many of Sapan's key personnel worked under Fahri Sadeh on Project Ahmad. So this atomic archive clearly shows that Iran planned at the highest levels to continue work related to nuclear weapons under different guises and using the same personnel. Finally, this update comes as the International Atomic Energy Agency again reports on Iran's latest violation of the 2015 JCPOA nuclear accords. And this less than a week after American officials estimated Iran's breakout time to a nuclear weapon as being just a couple of months away, or less. Joining us now with more insights into the assassination of top Iranian nuclear scientist Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, is former Israeli Deputy National Security Advisor, Professor Chuck Freelich. Professor, thanks for being with us now. Do you think that the Jewish Chronicle uh, piece describing Israel's involvement holds water? No. Why is that? Well, I, I'm not saying whether Israel was involved or not, but I think that the details and the estimates uh, presented there uh, are questionable. To believe that the assassination uh, would have provided Israel or whoever did it 
a gain of five to six years in the Iranian program. In other words, a postponement, I think, is vastly uh, overstated. You have to take into account that uh, Fakhalizadeh was certainly a particularly important figure, but he's one person in a very, very large and professional bureaucracy. Now think of it, if in Israel, in the US, any other country, the head of a, an important governmental agency was removed, what kind of an effect would that have? Well, it would probably disrupt things and cause some delay for a few months and maybe more, because Fakhalizadeh was a, a particularly important individual. But to go to you know, five, six years, as I said, I think is greatly overstated. All right, well, assuming that the report is true, that, you know, that would mean that Mossad agents are leaking information to the press in the United Kingdom. So do you think that this is the case, again, assuming that this is true, or is it more likely that the Mossad allowed this leak, quote unquote, anonymously so that Israel could take credit without taking responsibility? I don't know who did it. I don't know who's uh, leaking it. And I don't think that's the issue. The issue is what we do to ensure that Iran never gets a nuclear capability. And there are various measures, uh, diplomatic pressures and sanctions, targeted killings, uh, sabotage of the program. For example, there was the attack on the Natanz nuclear facility last summer, which was attributed to Israel uh, and was also significantly gained uh, more time than the killing of Khalil Zadeh did. So all these things together, that's the picture, that's the important thing. And the really critical question that we face at the moment is what position uh, Israel should be taking towards the Biden administration's apparent intention to go back to the nuclear deal. All right, well, that actually brings us to, to my final question. Why do you think the report uh, makes such a big deal about not telling the Americans, at least until the last second, you know, is it to make Israel feel bigger, in a sense, that they pulled one over on the Trump administration, or is that a dig at Biden as if to say, we're not afraid to act alone? Well, I don't think it was either. Actually, there's a sentence there saying that Israel may have given the U.S. some small clue in advance. And I would imagine that that is the case if this was an Israeli operation. There is a tradition, a, a longstanding practice between both countries and one which Israel has always been particularly careful to observe, which is not to surprise the U.S. Uh, with, with things like this, uh, especially an operational um, activity which can uh, have effects on the U.S. as well. So I would it's, imagine that the U.S. had some idea, but beyond that, it's an Israeli operation and uh, you don't have to tell everybody everything all the time, even your close allies. All right, Professor Friedrich, thank you so much for being with us and for your insights. Now, in lighter news, world famous, highly celebrated, and critically acclaimed filmmaker Steven Spielberg has just been awarded the annual Israeli Genesis Prize, AKA the Israeli equivalent to the Nobel Prize. Every year, the Genesis Foundation is granting a $1 million award to an individual based on their professional achievements or contributions to humanity and commitment to Jewish values. Therefore, this year, acclaimed director Steven Spielberg's winning for his unparalleled and continuing contributions to teaching post-war generations about the horrors of the Holocaust. But of course, while the prize is usually awarded at a gala event in Jerusalem each June, due to the coronavirus pandemic, it's unclear how and when this event will be held. Notable winners from the past, including former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg, actor Michael Douglas, New England Patriots owner Robert Kraft, and former political prisoner Nathan Sharansky. Now, speaking of philanthropy, first signs of getting back to normal are underway. And starting with a half marathon for charity this Friday, organized by the Chayenu Project by Chai Lifeline Israel. But here now to tell us all about the cause is volunteer at Chayenu Chai Lifeline Israel, Mickey Moose. Mickey, thank you so much for being with us. What is the Chayenu Project exactly? Um, so Chayenu Project is actually an organization, a nonprofit organization here in Israel. It's part of the Chai Lifeline family across the whole world and uh, what we do is we have uh, over 200 volunteers here in israel that supports kids and uh, that are battling uh, cancer and their families here in israel all across of the of the, of the country um so the reason we are having a marathon is that usually we run the jerusalem marathon 
and we have about 250 runners that run the marathon and in return they raise money for the organization to be able to run the organization so as of this year uh, 2020 there was a uh, covid 19 and uh, we had to make a decision that we're going to have to create our own marathon this year because the juicy marathon is not going to run so we decided that we're going to make our own marathon the men's only marathon now, and the women's only marathon in March, uh, for the kids to raise, for people to raise money for this uh, amazing organization. Cool. That's well. It's first of all incredible. But how will the marathon be adhering to coronavirus regulations? I know uh, you just mentioned how you're going to have two separate races: one men's, one's women, uh, one for women's. Uh, how how do you uh, plan to otherwise adhere to health regulations? <laughs> So right now, this uh, coming uh, tomorrow, we have 50 people running. So that's a smaller team than we have usually. Um, we also, it's going to be um, different start times. It's going to be first a group of a few runners, then another group of a few runners. Um, at the start point, everyone is going to have to wear a mask so, uh, and keep social di distancing. When the start is going to, when the marathon is going to start, then they'll be allowed to take off the mask and run individually the marathon. Okay, so I guess my final question, possibly the most important, when and where, and how to sign up? Um, so to sign up, it's very easy. If you just type on Google Team Lifeline Israel, directly straight away to our page, it's very easy to sign up. And uh, the run is going to be tomorrow morning in the, near Jerusalem, in the park, um, park uh, Adulam. Adulam. It's going to be Park Adulam. We, create, we found there a nice... Uh, route to run on and there's going to be a 10 kilometer run and a 21 kilometer run wow all right well mickey thank you again for coming in and telling us about this race to everybody who's participating in the race or, or who wants to participate in the race please do so and good luck mickey thank you again thank you thank you very much now we've often talked about getting healthy and how diet plays a role but israeli companies are raising the stakes again and this time with stakes but these are far from just any ordinary cuts of beef. This juicy ribeye, for example, was grown in a lab by Aleph Farms and the Technion Institute of Technology using non-genetically engineered cells isolated from a cow. And it was neither grown with antibiotics nor with ethical dilemmas of animal cruelty. Then, of course, Aleph Farms is not alone, with alternative meat manufacturer Redefine Meat making headlines as well. And this using a patented 3D printing process to create vegetable-based cuts at Redefine Meat's production is so convincing, by the way, that they successfully fooled a large group of blind taste testers using a food truck that sold out in less than five hours. But finally, if meat isn't your deal, no worries. Israeli companies like Remilk and Biomilk are also now going after the dairy industry, producing animal-free milk uh, products using proteins identical to the real thing, but developed and matured in a lab. And now, of course, let's take a look at the weather forecast with IELTV's Hannah Rifkin. Thank you, Aaron. Starting off with tonight's lows, we're looking at an average of 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 11 degrees Celsius. Then moving on to the weekend, our forecast calls for sunny skies with highs tomorrow at about 73 degrees Fahrenheit or 23 degrees Celsius. Then on Saturday, expect similar weather with an average high of about 71 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius. Back to you. Thank you, Hana. And now, before we go, a taste of what's going viral in Israel. Oh, no. <laughs> Timing of videos like these are so good. I always, I wonder when I'm watching things like this always, you know, what is the actual music that's playing? But I guess at the end of the day, it does not matter. This is great. And that is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.26 shekels to the American dollar and 2.57 shekels to the Canadian dollar. For more news from Israel, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And then don't forget, of course, to visit our all-new website at ILTV.tv and subscribe to our newsletter for the latest updates while you're there. I'm Aaron Porras. Stay healthy, have a wonderful weekend, and thank you so much for watching.